you're watching Market Cafe on ET Now with me Shreyanti Singh and with me is my co-anchor Sharul D'Souza and over the next one hour we'll take you through news and updates from within the country as well as across the globe also tell you which stocks you should keep on your radar and tell you what the brokerages are saying as well but first things first Sharul we've got to take a look at the US markets then. Absolutely a very good morning to you Shreyanti and no day is complete without talking about uh, U.S. markets, the way how they've actually shut shop. Remember, on Friday, you had the U.S. markets that ended in the positive territory. And the all thanks to the fact that now traders are actually betting for a bigger uh, rate cut coming in from the Federal Reserve. Remember, the FOMC meets this week, and it's a very crucial week because everybody's eyeing on that uh, direction of the rate cut coming in from the Federal Reserve. They, everyone's prized in that there is going to be a rate cut. But there has been debate about what's going to be the quantum of the rate cut, whether it will be 25 basis points or 50 basis points of a rate cut. But now if you look at uh, the CME's Fed Watch tool, it's even if you look at the way how uh, the uh, which side of the fence of uh, traders are moving in. So expectations for a 50 basis point has jumped to about 49% uh, from 28% on Thursday, while uh, there is about 51% probability that the Federal Reserve may go ahead for a 25 basis point rate cut. So that's the reason why you had the US market that shut shop in the positive territory on Friday. It ended, Dow ended higher by about uh, 7 tenths of percent. You had S&P 500 that ended higher by about half a percent. You had Nasdaq also that saw gains of about 6 tenths of a percent. If you talk about the weekly move then, Nasdaq as well as S&P 500, both, both of them actually logged their biggest uh, weekly percentage gain since uh, the week ended November 3rd, 2000. And 23. So for the week, you had S&P 500 that saw a good gain of about 4%. You had Nasdaq that saw gains of about 5.95%, uh, while Dow saw gains of about 2.6% for the week gone by. So all eyes on that crucial FOMC meet uh, and what uh, which side of the fence will a Fed actually move, whether it's a 50 basis point rate cut or 25 basis point rate cut. So yes, you had a very good handover coming in on Friday from the US markets, at least, uh, Shriyansi. Well, absolutely. And that meeting is also definitely something that oil markets are also looking at. But when you take a look at what happened with oil prices, oil prices fell on uh, Friday and this was as US Gulf of Mexico crude production also resumed following Hurricane Francine. And also, you did also have rising data that showed a weekly rise in US rig count as well. So when I'm taking a look at price levels, Brent crude was around those $71 per barrel level, so down to about half a percent coming in there for Brent crude. And when you take a look at US WTI as well, a downtick of about half a percent coming in for that one as well, and $68 per barrel is where WTI was also at. Now, this of course is as US Gulf Coast production as well as refining activity is resuming. Investors have also opted to offload oil contracts going into the weekend, and that is also something that we saw happening when it uh, hap also playing out when it comes to the oil markets and for the week oil futures of course finished higher following that sharp storm related increases early in the week as well now official data of course shows that the storm nearly shut 42 percent of oil production in the region that accounts for about 15 percent of u.s output so that largely is the kind of handover that we had now crude prices also of course took a hit from the u.s rig count from energy services firm Baker Hughes as well that reported the biggest weekly rise in oil as well as natural gas rig in a year as well. So that was an important update coming in when it comes to the Baker Hughes data. Now in terms of the overall picture that is emerging for oil, both the OPEC as well as the uh, e IEA or in International Energy Agency lower their demand growth forecast this week citing economic struggles in China which is the world's biggest importer of oil. So that was the kind of picture that we're seeing coming in. Not very bullish on demand, whether it is OPEC that you're talking about or IEA. So that largely is the handover coming in from oil. When you take a look at gold, gold was really powering high and gold prices did skyrocket after beating those record levels. After that boost in bullish momentum that we saw coming in, fueled by optimism that the US Federal Reserve is on the brink of trimming interest rates. So let's really see how that meeting pans out for us, Sharon. Absolutely, and uh, talking about the meeting, so yes, you're uh, kick-starting a brand new week, so let's take a look at the biggest talking point, and Federal Reserve officials uh, thread uh, into their two-day policy meetings, a step closer to the lower inflation target. Key question remains the quantum of the rate cut, like I mentioned, a week's worth of inflation data show that the price pressures have eased substantially since their meteoric rise since 2021-22. Uh, one of the gauge of uh, consumer prices uh, showed that 12-month uh, uh, inflation 
at its uh, lowest uh, since February 2021, while the wholesale price measures indicated pipeline price uh, increases are mostly under control. Uh, one of the, or rather on a simpler note, if you put all of that, the Federal Reserve has two jobs. One is stable prices and a healthy job market and the primary mission looks about uh, to change. That's what it looks like it now. All right, on to some more important news and updates than details. Still emerging from the latest suspected assassination on US presidential candidate Donald Trump. But here's what we know so far. Shots were fired near Trump's golf course in West Palm Beach in Florida. The apparent attempt on Trump's life came just two months after he was shot at a campaign rally in Pennsylvania, sustain sustaining a minor injury to his right ear as well. All right, shifting focus to China then, where the retail sales industrial production in the month of August grew slower than expected. The retail sales rose by about 2.1% on a year-on-year basis, missing uh, the economist expectations of about 2.5% rise. Meanwhile, the industrial production rose by about 4.5% on a year-on-year basis, lagging the forecast of 4.8%. The urban unemployment rate was 5.3% in August and an uptick from 5.2% in the month of July. What is important to note is that the growth in the world's second largest economy has slowed after disappointing recovery from the COVID-19 lockdowns and policymakers are yet to announce large-scale stimulus while acknowledging that the domestic demand is insufficient. And well, that's not all when it comes to China. Home prices in China have fallen at the fastest pace in more than nine years in August. What's evident is that the central bank's supportive measures have failed to spur a meaningful recovery in the property sector. New home prices were down 5.3% from a year earlier, the fastest pace since May 2015, compared with a 4.9% slide in July. In monthly terms as well, prices have fallen for the 14th straight month, downtick of about 7 tenths of a percent coming in, matching a dip in July as well. All right, then on to some other important news then. Oracle's best week on the stock market since 2021 has bolstered Chairman Larry Ellison's net worth, briefly edging him past the Amazon founder Jeff Bezos on Friday to become the world's second richest person. Ellison's net worth reached about $208.4 billion, while Bezos, who has claimed the title of the world's second richest person on and off over the years, is worth about $204 billion. Only Elon Musk at $252 billion is currently above him. All right, then that was your daily dose of uh, morning news and updates to go with your morning cup of coffee. But we'll be back with uh, a look on how the Asian markets are faring, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back. You're watching Market Cafe on ET Now. Let's take a look at the Asian screen and what the Asian markets are doing at this point in time. Remember that we got a good healthy handover coming in uh, from the US uh, markets on Friday. But today you have Nikkei that is actually shut in trade today. So that was a closing price on Friday coming in for Nikkei. So Nikkei is shut for, for a holiday in today's trading session. Let's take a look at what Hang Seng and Shanghai markets are doing because it looks like they've uh, started the note on a very weak footing. So 7.10% down to coming for Hang Seng as well as Shanghai is seeing a down to about half a percent or so as we speak while the implied Nifty open or uh, is actually showing uh, an uptick of about two tenths of percent but yes the asian screen is looking pretty weak at this point in time and Kospi is holding on to mild gains at this point in time however it's hang seng as well as shanghai that's down in fact uh, hang seng mainland property index is down more than three percent you also have uh, the tech index in hang seng also that's seeing a down tick about one percent or so so yes the picture for the asian markets is not that good at this point in time actually shayansi well, absolutely. But moving on, then we also have a power pack lineup for you on the market. The biggest voice on India's consumption story is going to be talking to us. And I'm talking about the former boss of HUL only on ET now. So do tune into that conversation at 9 a.m. At 9.20 as well, we have the market makers with Ravi Dharamshi who will be helping us identify mega trends and help us understand why the power story is the next big trend that is emerging. At 9.50 then, we'd be in conversation with Rajiv Rajgopal, Managing Director at Axo Noble, to discuss the company's growth roadmap. At 10 a.m., we'd be discussing the rural recovery and decode whether that's on track with Sunil Dugal, former CEO at Dabur, as well as Abnish Roy, Executive Director, Novama Institutional Equities as well. And to discuss 
the listing of Bajaj Housing Finance at 10:10 a.m. Sanjeev Bajaj, the chairman of the company, as well as Atul Jain, managing director, will be joining us. And to decode the capex plans of Tyro Care, lastly at 10:20, we'd be in conversation with Rahul Guha, to the MD and CEO of the company. So do stay tuned in to all of those interesting conversations. All right, all right. So power pack line up for you right here on ET now, but for. Thank you so much for staying tuned in. Let's get you some more news and updates then. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrived in Ahmedabad last week, marking his first visit to his home state since being sworn in for a third consecutive term. In fact, he also inaugurated India's first Vande Metro service, which will be run between Bhuj as well as Ahmedabad, along with several other Vande Bharat trains. Sami takes us through what to really expect when it comes to this network. India's first Vande Metro train is set to begin its commercial run from 16th of September and it will run between Bhuj and Ahmedabad in Gujarat. And here is the first look, first impression of Vande Metro train which has been built by ICF, Integral Coach Factory Chennai. Built similar on the lines of Vande Bharat train, Vande Metro train, if you see the color combination, the exterior colors is similar to Vande Bharat train, grey and orange color and you will find a branding of Vande Metro as well. Additionally, you will see the branding of Make in India along with Indian Railways. Now, let me take you inside that what sort of feature it has got for the passengers to make the entire travelling experience much, much better. So, begin with, this is the cock cockpit from where the entire train um, operation will take place. The pilots will be sitting over here with these advanced equipment. They will be operating the train. AC uh, air condition, it has been provided. Now let's get inside for the passengers. So as you enter the Vande Metro train, you will find that uh, very much it uh, resembles Vande Bharat train. For example, the automatic door closing system, LCD screen, the wide LCD screen over here that uh, gives the information to the passenger about the upcoming station or the speed of the train. Uh, if you see the vinyl wrapping aesthetically, very much it resembles to Vande Bharat train, but some unique feature it has got that will make travelling experience much better. For example, ample space has been provided in case of emergency, any passenger has to be, any patient has to be travelled for that ample space has been provisioned. Handicapped passenger, if he or she is travelling, then also sufficient space provision is there. Now, if you see the first impression, if you see a wider frame of the interior of Vande Metro coach, you will find a cushioned seat, a blue color combination that has been used, standing grills, the well dissemination of information that you will find, vestibule and so on. All right, Bihar will be holding an investor of Bihar summit in the month of December to attract investments in the state. The state is focusing on sectors like textiles and food processing, offering competitive policies and local procurement incentives to boost the corporate investments. In an exclusive chat with ET Now's Anurag Shah, you have Bihar's Industry Minister Nitish Mishra discussing the state's growth story and its strategic advantage. Bihar has really transformed in the last 20 years and our policy, maybe the industrial policy or the sectoral policies are as competitive with any other Indian states. This summer we will have a big investors meet. Textile is a very core strength for, for us, textile food processing because the major, if you will see the core strength of Bihar lies in the food sector. So food processing is another sector where we are foc focusing. We have come out with a local Bihar purchase preference policy where we are giving preference to the local procurements in all the government uh, purchases and plus the locational advantage because Bihar borders with Nepal, okay. Jharkhand eastern part of Uttar Pradesh. Bihar itself is a big market which I think the investors are now realizing. Policies are good, infrastructures are good. So now I think they are considering if they are discussing any state for future investment, I think I am happy to share that Bihar has also become a part of their discussion. So you just said that uh, all the gov Bihar government promoted companies are profitable companies. So how uh, you are planning to make these companies more bigger and what are the plans going ahead? If you will see in last 20 years, Bihar has maintained a very very positive growth rate and it has been doing very well. Rather, Bihar has uh, Bihar JSDP has been more than the 
national average also. So these PSUs, they are doing well with the public spending. If you will see the budget size with the better fiscal management, where we started in 2005 and where we are today in 2024-25, it's a huge, if you will see the transaction. So much of a welfare spending, schools coming, hospitals coming, roads, bridges. So these are coming. So I think these PSUs... No value unlocking plan you want to say? No. Private sector, because initially there was a time when these concerns were gone for liquidation in the Patna, they're pending in Patna High Court. Mm. So there are still issues, but the the PSUs which you have referred, all these are doing well. Mm. They have been established with a mandate to support the ministry and to or to increase their efficiency. All right, and some important commentary coming in from Bihar's industry minister right there. But moving on to some more news and updates and some relief for sugar mills, the Department of Food and Public Distribution has authorized sugar mills and distilleries to manufacture rectified spirit and extra neutral alcohol using sugar cane juice as well as bee heavy molasses. Now the latest move comes alongside the government's recent approval for sugar mills and distilleries to produce ethanol from sugar cane juice, bee heavy molasses as well as sea heavy molasses for the ethanol supplier 2024 to 25. Remember in December last year, the government prohibited the use of sugar cane juice or sugar syrup for ethanol production to ensure adequate sugar availability as well for domestic consumption and to keep the prices in check. So that's some relief coming in for sugar mills right there. Absolutely. So you have to uh, keep an eye out on all of those sugar counters in trade today. But ICL plans to open more than three hotels uh, per month next year. According to Puni Chatwal, who is the MD and CEO at IHCL, listen in uh, to a slice of exclusive conversation that he had with ET Nows and ET Nows Foundation's editor-in-chief Nikunj Dalmia to find out what else he has to say about company's plan for expansion. We have 112 hotels in pipeline. We will be opening almost uh, this year two hotels a month, next year more than three hotels a month. Um, we are signing at one hotel a week. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of growth is happening and our pipeline is 45% of our portfolio and operation. That is huge. So even if we stop signing any new contracts today in the next three, four years, we are going to see opening of almost 100 hotels. I think tourism has just started. Okay. So tourism, hospitality, uh, aviation, with the doubling of the airports, with so many six-lane highways being built, with the renaissance of the train stations. I think we are at the beginning of a very long story. And uh, it's not only a long way to go, it's like millions of miles to go. And uh, this sector is going to surprise uh, everyone in terms of its contribution to the GDP of the country and in terms of the feel-good factor, which people have just started relishing, especially post-COVID, is there to stay. And uh, as India becomes larger in terms of its economic size, economic relevance, uh, from number five to number three economy of the world, I think you will see more and more people traveling and more and more people uh, enjoying hospitality, food and beverage, uh, and all other uh, consumer uh, driven services that are available to them. Currently, the branded supply in India is, uh, is the lowest. The number of branded hotel rooms in India is equal to number of branded rooms in Singapore and Dubai together. That is 200,000 branded rooms of which Indian hotels has like a 15% share. So I think uh, then you can imagine what is expected to come and has happened elsewhere in the world. So among the top 20, 30 economies, we are possibly the lowest in terms of branded rooms per 1,000 people population in the country. So that's number one. Number two, globally, tourism has been contributing in double digit to the GDP growth and one out of four new jobs created as per WTTC have been in the tourism sector. Mm -hmm. Now, India is a little bit shy of 7%, a bit below, partially because we have the organized and unorganized sector or informal sector. Uh, so a lot of those jobs don't get counted, but they are uh, the indirect beneficiaries of the activity happening here. I think it would be fair to assume that over the next five to 10 years, tourism would be contributing also in India more than 10% to the GDP and also more than 10% to all the 
the jobs uh, that we count here in the country. All right, that was some important commentary coming in from Puneet Chitral then. Moving on, let's place the spotlight on the consumption pack that has witnessed a rebound. Market experts are of the view that it is time for the FMCG names to lead from the front. Hear out opinion from the likes of Sandeep Tandon, Nilesha, as well as Atul Suri and Vetri Subramaniam as well. Cross asset, cross market volatility should spike. And the background of geopolitical volatility, currency volatility, which means world is not going to be stable in this period. And that's one of the precise reason in last three months, our, uh, our portfolio, if you look at, is more skewed to the defensive side. And we still maintain that this cycle has still not ended. Let's say FMCG is a space which has been underperforming for a while. Okay. That's a space we have built our exposure. Valuation was not cheap, but uh, they started trading in the neglected territory. And hence that was the play. FMCG looks good. There is election money spending. There is budget spending. And there is good monsoon. And stocks haven't done well for some time. Valuations are elevated compared to market, but around historical leverages compared to their long-term trend. And hence, FMCG is one place which will outperform the market. The market is moving so fast that in just about a month or so, FMCG companies have rallied. We still believe within FMCG, on a bottom-up stock picking, there could be opportunity. Very bullish, the market as a whole. And there is a sector rotation happening right now, which really is the issue that I grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis. The issue is not about being in cash or being invested. I am fully invested. The issue is that the overweight in industrials and PSUs and defense has to now tilt slightly to IT, pharma and FMCG. Fantastic monsoon. So you're having record sowing. So the output is that you may have an excellent, excellent harvest. So I do think that the market is moving towards the rural driven themes. That is why, you know, when we talk of FMCG and stuff like that, you will find that they're doing very well. Some of the fertilizer stocks are doing very well. So I feel the market's moving on a bigger play from a risk on to a bit of a risk off mode. The valuations of all the sectors which typically used to trade at a big discount to the index have moved up very, very significantly. So to my mind, what's happening to some extent in both FMCG and IT is these sectors which typically held a very large premium to the benchmark have significantly eroded that premium. And actually, you've seen a lot more, I would say, cyclical businesses, which over time have tended to be cyclical, not just in terms of growth, but also in terms of their ROEs have actually moved up very dramatically in terms of valuation. So I think it's a little bit of a valuation normalization trade, whereby, you know, if you're going to start paying uh, FMCG multiples to capital good stock, then why not just look at the, cap you know, FMCG stocks where they may be rich, but they're far more stable in terms of medium term outcomes. All right, then on that note, we slip into a break on this edition of Market Cafe. When we come by, we'll tell you about all the stocks you need to know in trade today. Welcome back. You're watching Market Cafe on ET now. Let's put the spotlight on uh, Bajaj Housing Finance because that particular counter will be listing on the bourses today. My colleague Samit is here uh, to tell us more about that. Samit, uh, we're going to have a new debutant on the street today. Well, yes, a new debutant on the street today, and that's Bajaj Housing Finance, uh, which is a uh, subsidiary of Bajaj Finance. And this uh, listing of Bajaj Housing Finance is kind of a value unlocking moment for Bajaj Finance as well. Uh, now, uh, given the strong subscription numbers that we had seen for Bajaj Housing Finance, we're expecting a strong listing to happen. Uh, the list uh, IPO was subscribed over 63 times, and if you look at the grey market, uh, they are suggesting a premium listing of at least 90% when it comes to Bajaj Housing Finance. And this premium listing of Bajaj Housing Finance could also increase the SOTP value of Bajaj Finance, given the fact that it owns nearly 88.7% stake uh, in the company. Now, if you look at a 50% premium listing uh, then the SOTP value of Bajaj Finance increases by around four and a half percent and if the Bajaj Housing Finance lists at a premium of nearly 90 percent and stays there then the SOTP value of uh, Bajaj Finance increases by around eight odd percent so keep an eye out for Bajaj Finance as well in the trade apart from that a premium listing could also re-rate the other housing fin listed housing finance companies uh, now Bajaj Finance at the upper 
per end of the price band uh, was uh, on FY26 basis if you look at the valuations of that is price to book stood at, stood at close to 2.6 times and if there is a 50% premium listing then the valuation would increase to nearly 3.9 times a 70% listing would make a listing gain would make Bajaj Housing Finance the most expensive uh, listed housing finance company in India and a 90% listing would increase the valuations uh, to around 4.9 times for Bajaj Housing Finance. Now if you look at the other housing listed housing finance are uh, on uh, the stock exchanges it's Canfin Home, LIC Housing and PNB which are trading anywhere between uh, 1 to 1.9 times while the affordable housing players like uh, Awas, uh, Financiers, Aptus Value and Home First trade anywhere between 2.4 to 3.5 times. Thanks Amit for that update coming in. So uh, stay on with us while we take stock of some important commentary then where is Bajaj Housing headed over the next few years with an aim to be the next HDFC of the future, what is really in store for the company? Listen to what the top brass had to say there. In the case of three years, uh, very clearly what you will see is a full set, uh, um, full bouquet set of products and geographies for Bajaj Housing Finance. Uh, you will continue to see Bajaj Finance growing additional new lines of business that we've announced in the last 18 months. Uh, we'll start... Uh, becoming a reasonable part of the overall book. Uh, but I'll take a stab at uh, 2030 also. You may see very different avatars by then of ourselves. But I'll leave it at that. Okay. But uh, one of the avatars which in a sense is evident the way we look at Bajaj Fin Service moving to be a platform company. It's got platforms which are getting incubated. It's got platforms which are small but now become very, very large and relevant. So do you think Bajaj Finance in a sense, we'll talk about Bajaj Finance in 2030, it would really be a platform company. It would be a traditional company which is going the fintech way. Why should we look at 2030, Nikonj? Look at uh, Bajaj Finance today. Our uh, app has over 60 million users. We add over 10 million a year. Uh, in the last six years, we've added 24 million Indians who have entered the formal financial uh, cycle for the first time, which means moving them away from the unscrupulous uh, money lenders into a more institutionalized space. So we can see Bajaj Finance um, and in addition to that Bajaj Housing Finance uh, already leveraging the digital platforms that are available. And, and you know our presence is omni-channel. It goes from digital or we call it digital. It goes from physical to digital. So there are 130,000 stores around the country where you can enter, you can look at a particular product. Uh, you can go to a new housing project, look at a particular apartment, and from then onwards, your entire process becomes digital with us. And leveraging the best of the physical and digital world is what is helping us create this omnipresence uh, platform. Obviously, one bigger trigger is obviously the kind of response what we got in Bajaj Housing Finance. I think was that a lot of uh, uh, housing finance companies were under undervalued, and I think uh, we saw that the, the thing things coming back into it. So there was a value into most of the housing finance companies, which has flared up uh, quite sharply in last uh, uh, couple of sessions. I would be uh, tempting to book profits on Bajaj uh, Housing Finance at if it's a hundred percent listing gain. If it happens then I'm sure I would look at uh, booking profits uh, in that stock. So all eyes on Bajaj Housing Finance when it lists on the bourses today at 10 a.m. But let's shift focus to the aviation space and competition among the domestic aviation is just heating up as the airlines battle to get more market share. So I want here to tell us exactly what the data is throwing up and what can we find out with that aviation data for the month of August. Somit? Well, uh, if you look at the aviation data for the month of August, it is uh, pretty much weak. In fact, the growth is the lowest that we have seen in the last three months. The industry growth was just 5.5%, uh, which is uh, the lowest that, again, uh, as I mentioned, in the last uh, three months. Now, if you look at Tata Group and Akasa, they have managed to outperform the industry, posing a growth of nearly uh, 12 to 17 odd percent, uh, while SpiceJet's, uh, uh, it was a negative uh, growth, in fact, 44% below compared to what we had seen last year because of the financial crunch that the company has been 
been facing uh, and this was one of the major reason why the industry growth was also on the lower side uh, apart from that indigo's growth was also below the industry uh, growth of uh, at around 3.8 percent when you look at the market share uh, indigo's market share stood at close to 62.4 percent as against 63.5 percent that we had seen uh, previously that is last year in the second quarter of fy24 for tata group we have seen a notable increase in market share from 26.2 percent that we had seen in the second quarter it has increased now to 29.4 percent while spice jets has, has come down to around 2.3 percent for four, from 4.3 percent uh, in the second quarter now because of this a uh, weak uh, air traffic growth if you look at the passenger load factor which is also a measure of utilization for airline companies that has taken a big hit in fact if you look at the average numbers of august 19 to 2023 uh, we are just comparing the month of august uh, for passenger load factor here the average number stood at close to 84.4 percent while for august 2024 the number has come in at close to 82.9 percent which is a drop of nearly 150 basis points uh, again in this vistara has outperformed its uh, uh, passenger load factor has increased by around 380 basis points while for other airline companies it has declined anywhere between 130 uh, to 1100 basis points the highest being for spicejet uh, the passenger load factor has come down from 92.3 percent the average that we had seen earlier to 81 percent in august 2024 I mean, for joining us with that update, so that's a lowdown on air traffic data coming in. But as promised, let's get you the list of stocks that you should keep on your radar bright and early this morning. And Gaurav is joining us in the studio with that list then. Well, yes. When we talk about the stocks in focus, first let's talk about Edelweiss Finance because the company we saw in on Friday, we saw 1.6% of the equity changed hands and now we have names of the buyers and sellers. So first we have Abu Dhabi Investment, Ashoka India. These are the names of the buyers who are marquee buyers in a company where Edelweiss Employee Welfare Fund actually sold around 95 lakh shares. Uh, as, we, as a result, we saw the stock was up almost by 10% uh, on Friday. Next, let's talk about some stocks which are uh, the FMCG pack like HUL and GCPL. There's a negative news flow coming up for these stocks because India has now raised around by 20 basis point the basics import stacks on crude and refined edible oil and that could actually hurt the margins of these companies and as a result we will keep an eye on these companies as well. Next up we have is Excite Industries because company has invested around 100 crore rupees in, 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 in its one of the wholly owned subsidiaries Excite Energy Solution Limited and as a result we will be watching out on Excite as well. Up next, we have some pharma stocks. So first, let's talk about Zydus Life because company has now announced a licensing agreement to supply uh, gadolinium-based MRI injectables to US companies and that is the reason this company is going to be in focus. And on the other hand, we have Loris Labs because the company's uh, Hyderabad facility concluded its US FDA, uh, US FDA uh, facility and uh, I mean without any 483 observations. Lastly, we have Nazara Tech because the board meeting is going to be held on 18 September to consider and approve the fundraise for the company. So definitely watching out on all these companies on the back of the news flow that we have. Absolutely, we'll watch out for all of those stocks uh, Gaurav very closely because they will be in focus on back of news. But there are other stocks also that will be focused on back of the commentary coming in from where is management meet, what will be the impact on the stock, what are the key takeaways. Ashesha is here with all the details. Good morning to you, Ashesha. And which all managements have spoken over the weekend? Well, absolutely. First up, let's talk about Sriram Finance, where the management has guided for 16 to 17 percent AUM growth for AI25. They say passenger vehicles, MSME, and gold loans will be the key drivers of that 16 to 17 percent AUM growth that the management has guided for. They expect reported NIM to be in the range of 8.75 to 9 percent for the medium for the near to medium term, and they expect cost to income ratio to remain elevated at current levels. SBI Life, meanwhile has also come up with their commentary where they say they expect 18 to 19 percent individual APE growth for FY25. They expect retail protection growth to pick up in the third quarter of FY25 and the company is also focusing on group credit line. Apart from this, Uno Minda will also be in focus. Goldman Sachs in fact met with the management and they say that strong content-led order book expansion will offset growth moderation in the domestic car segment. Very positive management com commentary that has come in from all these three companies, these stocks and focus on the back of this. So Shesha for joining us with that lowdown on what uh, management needs really had to say but let's get back to the list of stocks that we're looking at this morning and Gaurav, uh, which are the counters that make it to brokerage radar there? Well, yes. 
First, let's talk about Axis Bank because CLSA has now maintained its outperform rating at a target price of 1400 rupees on this counter. What they believe is that the company is actually focusing on granularity and the growth of deposits which will help them to grow further. They are also confident that they will be able to grow a loan book around 3 to 4 points higher than the market and that is why they are maintaining their outperform rating. Next up we have is Hero Motors because UBS has now maintained its sell rating with a target price of 3350 rupees and what they believe is that Honda is very confident on outperforming Hero as a number one player in FI25. Other than, other than that, when we talk about Honda's dealership, now UBS believes that the dealership's inventory is almost at par. And with this, there is some electrification which is hurting hero strategies and, and that is why they are maintaining its sell rating. Up next we have is Macrotech because Nomura has initiated with buy rating and a target price of 1600 rupees on this company. What they believe is that the company has solid earnings growth visibility and the capital allocation is also at a right place. Apart from that, they are expecting the pre-sales growth to remain at a CAGR of around 20% over the next two years. And lastly, when we talk about some re-rating strategies also, they believe that there are visible re-rating triggers for the company and that is why they have initiated with buy rating and a target price of 1600 rupees which leaves a healthy upside from the current market. Market price. So definitely watching out on all these counters on the back of the news flow as well as the brokerage note that we have received today. All right, thank you so much for that, Gaurav, for outlining the stocks that have been focused on back of brokerages as well. But Jefferies has come out with this strategy for India. Uh, it exercises near-term caution for SMIDs, uh, industries and global cyclicals. They've also made some uh, changes to their model portfolio and very startling one actually. Varun is here to tell us what exactly are the details of that. A uh, very good morning to you, uh, Varun. And very, uh, uh, the note, if you look at the note, the changes are very startling, isn't it? Definitely, the changes are there and uh, for the near term actually Jefferies has turned cautious on in Indian markets, especially on the small and mid caps, industrials and global cyclicals, uh, although they, are, uh, they sh see some green shoots on uh, consumption. Now the reason for turning cautious is basically they say that the domestic inflows that has come from Jan to August, they are highly unsustainable and it makes them uncomfortable in the near term for equity outlook, especially in the mid caps, small caps and industrials. Along with this, if you look, uh, basically the government is turning populist and this is one of the reasons uh, that they are uncomfortable with the uh, Indian markets. Also, uh, on the CAPEX cycle, they say for the long term view on the CAPEX cycle, it remains unchanged for them. But for the short term, they think uh, that the budgeted CAPEX would not rise as expected and hence they have turned cautious on Indian markets. They have reduced weight on Reliance, um, uh, Amber Enterprises and replaced LNT with Siemens with a lower weight. Also, they have added MQ Pharma and Indigo in the model portfolio. They have increased weight on HDFC Bank, believe banking stocks are near the inflection points. And they are neutral on industrial and underweight on energy, overweight on telecom, autos and staples and power. So basically, if you look, they have turned a bit cautious on Indian markets and uh, base, they say that uh, there are some green shoots in consumption. All right, thanks Varun for joining us with that update. Let's get you some more news and updates from outside the world of stocks, news, uh, uh, bulls, bears and bonds. And uh, let's take a look at uh, a day after being granted bail by the Supreme Court, Aam Admi Party Supremo and Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has announced his decision to step down as the Chief Minister. Kejriwal will be submitting his resignation to the Lieutenant Governor tomorrow. Meanwhile, AAP has also called for early polls in the national capital. Moving on, then no end to the impasse between Doctors and the Mamta Banerjee government in Calcutta. Doctors continue their protest outside Swaste Bhavan. <coughs> Meanwhile, Bengal Junior Doctor Association and the Resident Doctors Association from across the nation are all set to lead the strike in the national capital and hold a joint presser today. Moving on from common people to celebrities and even politicians, all continue to throng in large numbers to get a glimpse of La Lal Bagh Saraza. You have Maharashtra Deputy Chief Minister Ajit Pawar was seen visiting the iconic uh, Lal Bagh Saraza and also offered prayers to Lord Ganesh. And SpaceX uh, Polaris uh, Dawn uh, crew returns home after a historic mission. The five-day mission made history as it reached a higher altitude that any, that any human has travelled in five decades. A commercial spacewalk also marked the first time such an endeavour has been completed by a privately funded and operated mission. Alright then, with that, we're completely out of time on this edition of Market Cafe on ET Now. From me, Shreyansi Singh, Sheryl D'Souza, as well as the entire team that put this show together. Thank you so much for tuning in. You don't go anywhere because the market takes all of the action forward.
If you like this video, then like, share, and subscribe to ET Now.